At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Some ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely, surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance, and among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. I wonder, what has stood out to you this morning? What has impacted you? What has the Spirit been saying to you in these moments together? Maybe even in your devotion as you prepared to come to church this morning. What stood out? Just, I'd love to you, love you to just take a moment now, just with the person next to you, just to share one thing. What, what has impressed you? What have you been thinking about? Let's do that. Let's take a few moments. And if you're online watching, love you to just write something in the comments or share if you're watching with someone. Let's, let's spend a few moments now. What's impacted you? What stood out? Good morning, everyone. It's so good that you are here. Can we, before I get into the message this morning, can we thank everybody who has worked super hard to create a space where we are able to behold Jesus together this morning? So can we do that? We have had incredible worship. I mean, look at all of these stations and the walkthrough. There's been a lot of time and effort put in. Beck, Tam, Amy, our worship team, the creative planning team have done a wonderful job this morning. Would you agree with me? Amazing. Really proud. And uh, it worries me because we've set the bar too high for next year. <laughs> it's fantastic though, isn't it? A uh, special welcome to all of our new friends in the room. I know there's a number of new friends in the room. Uh, all of the children, we've got our children in today. Is it? Can we welcome our children? <laughs> Always good to have our children in with us in big church. And also, I want to welcome everybody who is watching online. Uh, if you're watching online, watching our Good Friday service online, could you, like, I'm, I'm trying to be an influencer here, can you make sure you like, hit the bell, and subscribe? <laughs> All right, that would be really good. And comment. I think hit the bell is subscribe. Oh, who knows? <laughs> well, it's good to be, welcome to Good Friday service. And, you know, for some of us, especially if you've been walking around and we've seen the images and we've heard the readings, uh, you know, we could think, man, there's not a lot of good about um, Good Friday, especially 
with what was inflicted on our Saviour, what was inflicted on Jesus. It, it was pretty, pretty gruesome. But it is really, really, it's a really, really good day. And, um, uh, you know, even though all of these events that surrounded that day some 2,000 years ago, uh, even though they were horrific and horrible, uh, it is a great day. It's a great day for us. So today I want to spend some time on Mark chapter 15, verses 42 through to 47. And, then, and these verses actually focus on the, the burial of Jesus. And because uh, Luke actually took us through uh, some of that scripture last week uh, in our services, I want to focus on the burial. Now, I wonder, I know many of us in the room, we, we would have lost someone who was close to us. Each and every one of us. You know, it's painful, isn't it? It's painful, it hurts. And just then we heard uh, Tam's very moving testimony as she paralleled uh, her experience or the experience of losing her brother-in-law with those who witnessed the death of Jesus all of those years ago. Her story brought back... <laughs> A ton of emotion for me because I was actually um, privileged to be in the room with Tam and Emma on that day when Ben passed and uh, so hearing Tam yeah brings all sorts of emotion back uh, when Tam says that he was in excruci excruciating pain he was in excruciating pain uh, we we tried to comfort him the best that we could. And we urged him, we, we, we were urging him in the end just to go home, to go home to Jesus. And we were there and we all saw him took his, take his final breath, slipping into the presence of Jesus. No more weeping, no more hurt, no more pain. It was one of the, the saddest uh, things that I've ever witnessed, but it was also one of the most sacred and holy moments that I've ever been a part of in my 25 years of ministry. I remember standing with Em and Tam embracing, you know, we're kind of all looking at each other going, what do we do now? And we were embracing at the end of Ben's bed and uh, we, we knew he was gone. He looked so peaceful. Uh, he looked like he was sleeping. And even though Tam and Emma and all of us were so devastated that, Tam, that Ben was gone, we were relieved that he was now longer in no more pain. You know, I've lost a number of people who, are close, who have been close to me now. I've also conducted a number of funerals. And for me, it's the funeral. I don't know about you, but for me, it's the funeral. I think that's why it's so important. The funeral is where it really hits home. It really hits home that my loved one is now no longer with us. They are gone. It's when I, I push that committal button and that coffin slides into the tomb that I hear the louder sobs of those who are present because they realize this is really happening. They are gone. So the five verses that I'm about to read to you are super important in the context of our faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins. I think I've underlined it there. Christ died. Jesus died. That's what I want you to get this morning. Jesus died. Christ died. According to the scriptures. That he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. You'll need to come, on, come back on Sunday to hear Dave celebrate and speak on the resurrection in, in, a, in a few days' time. But you know what? If Jesus didn't die, guess what? Jesus didn't die, he didn't rise from the dead. 
And if he didn't rise from the dead, our faith is futile. Our faith is useless. Our faith is absolutely pointless. It's a waste of time, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. And because of this, many opponents over the years have tried to argue that Jesus did not die. Some believe that only that he only uh, appeared to suffer and die, whatever that means. And others say that he switched places. And who do you, who do you think they think that he switched places with? They thought that he switched places with Simon of Cyrene. Simon was the guy that carried the cross. And they thought that Simon was the one who was actually crucified. So today, I want to ask the question, did Jesus really die? And I also want to ask another question, a follow-on question to that, and that is, why did he die? And then I want to personalize it for everybody in the room and for everyone watching online. I want to personalize it by asking you, do you believe what the Bible says about the death of Jesus? Do you believe it? And my hope is that as we look at the ancient text today, that together we will behold Jesus. Just like the many witnesses of, uh, at the time that were recorded in the scriptures. And just like John the Baptist did right back at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. You know, the word behold, I, I wonder, did anyone use the word behold maybe last year in a sentence? It's not really a word that we use too often, is it? It means to see or observe someone or something, especially of remarkable impre or impress impressive nature. That's what behold means. It's kind of like, wow. And my prayer is that each of us would be blown away impressed once again you know it's such a familiar story to us isn't it but we would behold Jesus we would be impressed once again by this remarkable person Jesus so I want to pray Holy Spirit Holy Spirit please continue to to move in our midst to speak to us to reveal Jesus to us and to have our heart to, to help us to have hearts and ears and eyes open to behold Jesus this Good Friday. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read today's text. I'm wondering, can we stand for the Word of God this morning? Mark chapter 15, verse 42. It says, it was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, this is probably making it roughly around sort of 4 p.m. in the afternoon, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. So Joseph brought some linen, cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of, cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And then in verse 47, it says, Mary Magdalene the Mary, um, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. That's God's word for us this morning. Love you to take a seat. That's God's word, and I am here to boldly proclaim to you that Jesus died. How do we know that Jesus died? Well, there were witnesses. I want to take you through a number of the witnesses. Firstly, the women. The women witnessed the execution of Jesus, and importantly, they also witnessed his burial. The place where he was laid to rest. And that is, if you read on, 
16 verse 1, which David's speaking on on Sunday, you'll read there that that is how they knew exactly where to go three days later when they went to anoint Jesus' body. Now, uh, Jews didn't embalm bodies, but what they used to do, because of the Palestinian climate hot, that the stench of the rotting body would have been quite horrendous. So this anointing is to essentially mask that, that stench. And the women were prepared. Even just think about that. The women are prepared to go and do that. It's amazing. The women were with him at the beginning and they were there with him at the end. Unlike the male disciples who had vanished completely from the scene. They cared for his needs like angels in his most vulnerable moment. And it's, is it any wonder that Jesus chose to appear to them first when he had risen? The women were witnesses. The next witness is a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Again, what is really noticeable is the absence of those who were supposed to be closest to him. His disciples, you know, the big tough men. They are nowhere to be seen. They did not take the bold risk and they did not hurry to bury the body of Jesus. You know, Jesus, uh, Joseph's urgency meant that Jesus' body, his dead body, did not have to hang there over the Sabbath. And, and, and that was a Jewish law that that actually couldn't happen, uh, that a dead body it did not permit this. So there's this urgency to get the body down off the cross. The text says that Joseph was a member of a, a Jewish council, most likely a, a Sanhedrin in his local region of Arimathea. In Luke's account, it says that Joseph was a good and upright man who, did not, who actually did not consent to the condemning of Jesus. John's gospel tells us that he was a secret disciple of Jesus. And he was... And, 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 and he was actually assisted by Nicodemus, who had brought spices to help prepare the body of Jesus for burial. Interesting, Nicodemus and having that late night conversation with Jesus. Here's Nicodemus in the scene as well. They text, uh, the text also says that he was a prominent member of the council. And that could just simply mean that he was respected, uh, he was noble, he was influential, or could have even meant that he was a wealthy person. But what I want you to get here is that what Joseph did was extremely risky. Extremely risky. This bold act would have identified him as a follower of Jesus. And as a member of the Sanhedrin, this would have had some serious consequences, a risk that he was actually prepared to take. This is something that we just can't brush over. It's important that we get this. That's Joseph of Arimathea. The next, we have Pilate. Verse 44 says that Pilate was surprised that Jesus was dead. Um, now, now, that was so because it often took two or three, I think Luke spoke a little bit about that last week, that it took two or three days for a crucified person to die. And as I sort of re researched that a little bit more, uh, some commentators believe, some historians believe that if you were uh, quite strong and fit, you could actually last up to 10, which is quite incredible when you think about that. Um, Oftentimes, bodies would be left there to rot and be eaten by birds and rats, especially if you had been convicted of treason. And you know why they did that? They wanted to use it to influence the masses and to be a deterrent to others who were thinking that it might be cool to do something like that, be a criminal. However, Christ's death was quick. Many believe this to be true because of the, the punishment and the absolute flogging that was inflicted before being nailed to the cross. 
Others say that God could not bear to witness the suffering of his son. And others believe that he, he, uh, he, he did not die of asphyxiation, which is what usually happens when someone um, dies and someone dies being crucified. But they believe he died of a broken heart. And you know what? I don't have, un- I don't have time to unpack that. It's really well documented by doctors and people who are way smarter than me. Hop online and have a read. You know, it's the, the, the water and the blood when, it, when, he, when he was pierced in his side uh, gives it away. So go and check that out for yourself. So Pilate, he gets confirmation of Jesus' death from another key witness. Who was that other key witness? The centurion. Now, the centurion here was most likely the one mentioned in verse 33, uh, 39, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died. Saw how he died. He said, surely this man was the son of God. You know what, church? That is a behold moment. That is a moment when someone goes, wow! The Roman soldier had witnessed someone and something remarkable and he was absolutely impressed by Jesus. He had a revelation of who Jesus really was. And he was able to confirm to Pilate that in fact Jesus had passed away. Jesus was dead. So with that, Pilate is then confident to release the body of Joseph, which is highly unusual because a body is usually released released to a close friend or a family member. However, again, the disciples are nowhere to be seen. Uh, The women were definitely not in a position to ask or do anything about it. And there is no evidence of any of Jesus' relatives being in Jerusalem at the time. A guy by the name of J.A. Brooks, who's a a commentator, wrote this. He said, The historicity of of the account is firm. The historicity of this account is firm. The early church would not have invented a story about Jesus being buried by a Jewish leader, who at most was a secret disciple, rather than his family or, or close disciples, Nor would invention have made women the chief witnesses of the event. Mm. I'm here to proclaim to you today, Jesus died. Jesus died. And this was backed up by the testimony of those who were there that good Friday. And you know... The other really amazing thing is there are many, many Old Testament scriptures which bear witness, which foreshadow Christ's death long before it actually happened. Let me take you on a bit of a journey really quickly. I'm going to fly through some scriptures. Psalm 22 has amazing foreshadowing and parallels to the death of Christ. Check it out. I'll give you some. Psalm 22 verse 16 it says dogs surround me a pack of villains encircles me they pierce my hands and my feet what you need to realize here is that this psalm was written hundreds of years before crucifixion was even a thing it's quite amazing psalm 22 verse 18 says they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Isaiah 53 verse 12 says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Psalm 22 verse 6 But I am a a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. 
They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Amos chapter 8, verse 9. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Psalm 69, verse 21, They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. And lastly, Isaiah 53, verse 9, He was assigned a grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. I don't know about you, church. I don't know about you, but to me, this is absolutely remarkable. The detail foreshadowing actual events in Mark 15, written many, many years before, is absolutely astonishing. This cannot be coincidence. And you know what? This is only a snippet of Old Testament prophecies that foreshadow the coming Christ, his death and resurrection. I wonder, do you believe what the Bible says about the death of Jesus? Do you believe? For those of you who hear me speak often, I like to ask the question, well, so what? So what? You know, we've just looked at the fact that Jesus died. However, as we finish, I think it's super important that I ask the question, or we look at the question, why did he die? And to do that, I want to take you all the way back to Mark chapter 1. We've been on this long journey, haven't we, in the book of Mark. And so I'm going to take you all the way back to, to Mark chapter 1, where we're introduced to a wild man. We're introduced to a camel-wearing, hair wearing, locust-dipped-in-honey-eating prophet, John the Baptist. And as soon as he saw Jesus, he knew who he was and what he was sent to do. He was impressed with Jesus. And John is recorded uh, as saying this in John chapter 1 verse 29. It says this, The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, what church? Behold! Behold! It's almost like, wow! The Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. And then a few verses down in verse 35, it says, The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, behold the Lamb of God. You know, seeing Jesus once wasn't enough. You know, it's kind of like, wow, there he is again. The Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. You see, John the baptizer knew. He knew straight away. He knew as soon as he saw Jesus. Right at the start of Jesus' ministry, he knew his purpose, he knew his mission was to rescue us. To rescue us, to rescue the world from this deadly disease called sin. It's deadly because it says in Romans Chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned, we've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin is what? It's death, which is separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through who? Christ Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And roughly three years later, this rescue mission that was foretold by John the baptizer 
was complete when Jesus died on the cross. And three days later, rose again, defeating sin and death once and for all. You see in Romans 5 verse 6, it says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, you know, there's nothing we can do to get to God. Nothing. No good works. We can't pay our way there. Doesn't matter how many toys you have. We can do nothing to be saved. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? He died because he loves you. He died because he wanted to take away my sin. He wanted to take away your sin. He wanted to take away the sin of the world so that I and you and us, we can really live. He did that so that we can really live. He did that so that we can have a relationship with the Father. No longer any more separation. And today, you have people in the room, people maybe watching online, you have the opportunity to behold Him, to say yes to Him, to say, I'm a sinner. And I am in need of a saviour. I need you, Jesus. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you want to be saved? You will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. So, if you, wanna, if you want Jesus to do what he came to this earth to do for you, then can I encourage you just to simply pray this prayer. Let's all bow our heads, bow our hearts. Please join with us online and just pray this prayer. If you want to behold Jesus today, if you want to say yes to him today, just pray this prayer with me. And if, you're a, if you've been following Jesus for a long time, can you just pray in this moment? Pray the Holy Spirit would move. Pray that the Holy Spirit would call people into relationship with God, with him. So let's pray. If you, want, if you want Jesus, pray this prayer with me. God, I know that I have broken your commandments and my sins have separated me from you. I am truly sorry. And now I want to turn away from my sin. I want to stop living for myself and I want to live for you and I want to live for others. Please forgive me. Help me to do this, I pray. I believe that your son Jesus Christ died for my sins, was resurrected from the dead, is alive, and hears my prayer today. So today, I say yes to you, Jesus, and I invite you to become the Lord of my life, to rule and to reign in my heart from this day forward. Please send me. Please send me your Holy Spirit to help me live for you and to do your will for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we, church, can we in faith celebrate everyone who might have prayed that prayer this morning? Can we celebrate that? And if you said yes to Jesus today, I want to welcome you into the family of God and I also want to encourage you to tell someone ASAP. Before you go today, 
Tell someone. If you're watching online with someone, tell someone. Send them a text. Put it in that comment. I said yes to Jesus. And we ask you to do that. We don't, we don't ask you to do that to embarrass you. We do that so that we can give you a Bible. We do that so that we can encourage you, so that we can pray for you, so that we can get you connected with someone who might help you in your newfound faith. Would you do that? Would you be bold today to let someone know? We're also pretty keen to get, get you connected maybe in a group, in something that will encourage you in your faith. I mentioned a group there. Well, church, I want you to know we, we are actually uh, starting on Wednesday nights from May the 4th, 7 to 8.30 here at the church. It'll go till mid-June. Uh, we're starting a small group called Discovering Jesus. And that's going to be facilitated by Liz. And we'd love you to come that. You know, this space is a space that will be created for, uh, for, for us to read different stories about Jesus, his life, his teachings. And then we're going to have interactive discussion about that. It's great. It's fantastic. I'd encourage you to jump in. And uh, it'll be good for you if you have just said yes to Jesus. It'll be good for you if you're still, oh, I need to do some more uh, work on this. You're exploring faith. It'll be a great group for you to be in. So I encourage you to find out more and to come along starting May 4, Wednesday, Wednesday nights, discovering Jesus. Keep an eye out for more information. Well, church, been a bit of a journey this morning. What I want us to do as we wrap up is to grab a hold of your communion. And as we move into the next segment of our service, I want you to take the bread and the cup and I want you to remember once again the sacrifice of Jesus. So let's eat and drink in remembrance of our King, in remembrance of our Saviour. God bless and thank you for listening.